Hi, my name is Pratik Tripathi and I'm a PhD student at Imperial College London. Uh, today I'm here to present on the topic Brain Inspired as Fit Arrays, a tiny ML approach to lab on chip diagnostics. Uh, my supervisors are Professor Pantley's Giorgio and Dr. Nicholas Moser. The presentation will begin with a bit of background and motivation behind this PhD. I'll then discuss the opportunity where I would like to add that the diagnostics of the future will no longer be limited to just certified labs. And so we believe that the future of diagnostics and machine learning is both tiny and bright. We would then like to present certain research questions that we have phrased in this journey. This will be followed by the current progress that we have made to answer these research questions. And finally, the future work that we think are, is needed to enable tiny ML in diagnostics. So here we have the ion sensitive field effect transistors, also known as SFETs. Uh, these are basically fabricated as a MOSFET with a floating gate. Any change in the ion concentration on the surface of the MOSFET or the SFET device presents itself as a change in the threshold voltage of the device itself. So here you have a MOSFET sitting right next to your SFET. That means that these can be created in unmodified CMOS technology. Uh, to model an SFET, what you need is to extend uh, the gate to the top layer and so you use capacitance to model the passivation layers and then you use uh, other capacitances to model the solution and finally the reference electrode is modeled using a voltage source. Uh, so. But like all other devices, SFETs also suffer from non-ideal effects. Uh, in this case here on the right we have a figure where you have multiple SFET sensors on the same chip. Uh, but you can see that for the same pH value, they present different, they start at different values, or they have an offset in their in initial values and they drift over a period of time. Uh, this offset is known as trap charge, uh, which is basically the charge that gets trapped on the floating gate of the SFET. And this is most likely due to the charge transfer during chip production, which introduces an offset in the threshold voltage of the device. Drift, on the other hand, is a slow monotonic change in the threshold voltage of the SFET, and it originates from a transport phenomenon. Uh, that the interface between the insulator and the solution. Uh, but we found something interesting in 2019 and we published that in SCAS, which is that non-idealities are spatially correlated. And this was done by running experiments on a chip uh, known as Titanix on AMS 0.35 micrometer. Uh, and uh, we are going to test this hypothesis further over the course of this research. And so that brings us to an application of, of this, which is DNA detection. Uh, so in this case, you can use it to detect certain diseases. It has we have proven this technology for COVID-19. Uh, so here you have the chip and a microfluidic chamber on top of it where it has two wells. The top well is the sample well. The bottom well is the control well. Uh, the output, uh, can, as you can see, uh, has, in the case of positive, has an inflection point. Uh, whereas in the case of negative, there's no inflection point. And this presents itself in the form of a sigmoid for a positive result. Uh, the main attempts in the past so far have been to use signal processing for compensating the output of these fits using circuit techni techniques, and they've not provided adequate results. This is sort of sort of one of the more ideal output, output scenarios. And so far, all previous works have focused on standard signal processing methods where they try to identify this inflection point in the time series output signal as an amplification event. And so this motivated us to take inspiration from the smartest learning tool in our body, the brain. The brain has neurons as its main learning component. Neurons operate in the spike domain. They have a high dynamic range. They consume low power, show cooperation. And that means that they have the plasticity to learn new things. And so this has formed the basis of neuromorphic intelligence, which is leading the way sort of for new models of computation. Because ever since the exascale, on the one hand, we've been looking at more efficient architectures and packaging. And on the other hand, we've been looking at uh, new materials and devices. But we as engineers, of course, we love the new models of computation. And neuromorphic is leading the way there. And this is because it is analogous to the morphology of the nervous system due to its spiking. Um, it combines analog, asynchronous digital, and logic circuits. It yields application-specific devices that are optimal for edge computing. And finally, what is very interesting is that MOSFETs and weak inversion use diffusion for charge transfer, which is similar to the ionic current in neurons. And so we saw a huge opportunity here. That is, since both neurons and SFET respond to by variation and concentrations, there's a great opportunity here to combine neuromorphic circuits with potentiometric SFET sensing. Right. And so we proposed the 
ISFET model of a neuron, uh, which is analogous to the Hodgkin Huxley model of a neuron, where we change the conductance with ISFET themselves, the conductance channel with ISFET channels itself. And uh, companies have been working on the on, on on using sort of neuromorphic circuits, where you have companies like Prophecy that have proposed asynchronous event-based cameras as compared to the standard cameras, and they they provide a lot more information while still having a lower latency and working at ultra low power. And so the second opportunity comes from machine learning itself, where we know that, as I said earlier, the future of ML is tiny and bright, right? Because if you if you notice, uh, according to a Cisco report, five quintillion bytes of data has been produced by IT devices every day uh, in 2018. And less than 1% of that unstructured data has been used at all. And so we do not want to add diagnostic data to, to, to this because patient privacy is, is much more important. And so in TinyML, what we are specifically interested in is that the sensor data can be presented in the form of image or time series for us. And that will ena enable us to perform spatial or time series analysis using machine learning models at the edge that have already become popular in, in other applications. And so I embarked upon my journey of brain-inspired aesthetic sensing, where my first approach was to mimic the biological processes of the brain and hence de define the field of neuromorphic aesthetic sensing, where I looked at integrating fire structures, clustering, and spike processing. Uh, the second paradigm of uh, tiny M was TinyML, where I wanted to use the data that the aesthetic sensors are, being, are generating and be able to give classifications using small microcontroller devices uh, by using tf light micro and, uh, and, and spectrograms. And so my review of the literature helped me frame my research questions that I'm, I've been trying to answer over the course of this, this PhD, which include, you know, like, what is the role that non-ideal effects uh, have in a cluster of ISPET neighboring pixels? And do non-ideal effects present any form of spatial correlation? What methods can be used to multiplex compensation approaches among clusters of ISPET sensors? How can a slow chemical reaction on the surface of electrochemical sensors benefit from the event-based neuromorphic approaches? How can neuromorphic approaches be implemented for ISFET structures? Are the properties of an ISFET sensor closer to an image sensor or an audio sensor? What are the best transformation techniques to better visualize and make decisions from the ISFET sensors? What role can AI play in the speed up of diagnostics for new diseases? Does the use of AI-based solutions bring any concerns on privacy and security? And how can TinyML or Edge AI alleviate these concerns? Finally, what are the trade-offs between compensation using neuromorphic approaches and TinyML? So to answer this, my current progress so far has includes the, the fabrication of a chip. I've, I've, I know ISFET neurons work based on that chip. Uh, I have spatial correlation proven uh, through two different chips now. And finally, we've worked on a TinyML model for classification of nucleic acid amplification. Uh, that brings me to the first uh, topic, uh, which is the neuromorphic side. So this is the concept of a neuron-based ISFET array, where we present neuromorphic-based ISFET arrays, where we encode the pH into the spike domain. Uh, uh, and this means uh, the device non-idealities can be treated in the, in the form of a cluster, uh, and, and you can use cluster-based structures to, to deal with non-ideal effects. Uh, then this also allowed us to sort of propose the use of AER for array data acquisition and that enables low power operation. And finally, overall, this work paves the way for both neuron based architectures for ISFET front end and relaxes requirements for compensation circuit by leveraging on spatial correlation. And so that brings us to the pixel architecture uh, where you convert the input pH to an output spike uh, based on this equation. Uh, where the front end of or the ISFET readout uh, generates a current that charges the membrane capacitance and the integrate and fire structure generates spikes based on that. And so we, we tested the hypothesis using uh, TSMC 0.18 micrometer. Uh, this uh, was basically a chip that we called Goku and you can see some spikes being generated. Uh, it passes through digital structures and so that's, that's why it, it converts to a proper digital signal. Um, and uh, the sensitivity that we are see seeing right now is 0.026 kilohertz per millivolt or the chemical sensitivity is 0.33 kilohertz uh, per pH. But when it comes to neuromorphic architectures, what we realized was that all our efforts were based on the attempts made in CMOS images. And so it was important to 
consider how close a photoreceptor is to an aspect. While in the case of a photoreceptor, you have a photon that's incident on a photoreceptor, and once energy is transferred, you have an electron hole pair ge generation that occurs, and this, this particular photon loses its energy. In the case of misfits, it's slightly different. Once an ion is generated during the chemical reaction, it sort of stays in the field of, of the isfet, and so it, 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 it causes something that I would like to call heat voltage accumulation. And that, that itself means that we have a much more dynamic background as compared, compared to a, a, a photoreceptor. And so we realized background inhibition would play a major role, and that is where we decided to use a winner-take-all structure to implement background inhibition in neuromorphic isfet arrays where our aim was to investigate the benefits of neuromorphic electronics by taking advantage of the fault-tolerant nature, spatial connectivity, spike domain processing capabilities, neuron inhibitions, and AER compatibility. So this is the ISFET winner-take-all architecture, where, as you can see, you have a common gate configuration generating an output current that is mirrored, erred, uh, out into a winner take all structure and if this particular pixel wins it gets to uh, generate a winning current onto the membrane capacitance and use the integrate and fire to generate uh, the spikes right where as you can see the, this is the charging time of the membrane capacitance this is the feedback uh, amplifier that's causing the spike and finally the refractory period here which we can also control as an external source to make corrections against non-ideal effects uh, so as you can see, on the one side you have spike frequency versus pH, and on the other side you have spike frequency versus VRFR. So we have two control points and the winner take all structure here. Uh, the winner take all structure will thus act as a spatial filter, which is adaptive due to the current averaging, uh, which acts as a bias current generator for the winner take all itself. So we're not generating any separate winner current. And in the end, the address of spike generation will be the location of the largest variation in ionic concentration uh, along with uh, an averaged out value of the entire cluster. And so as you can see here, uh, this winner take all simulation has around 9 pixels and uh, pixel 3 to pixel 9 are set to a constant voltage of 330 millivolt and the other ones, that is pixel 1 and 2 are changing. And so when pixel 1 wins, it spikes. When pixel 2 wins, it starts spiking, and so on. Uh, so this is basically the cluster-based approach that we are proposing. On the one hand, either you can cluster the winner-take-all structures together, where all similar colors form part of the same cluster, or you could also divide uh, the winner-take-all amongst different locations on the chip. And that means the area of the chip that requires more resources will be able to fire more frequently as compared to the other areas by competing against other locations on the same chip. And so that brings us uh, to TinyML in diagnostics, uh, the second part of TinyML in diagnostics, which is um, where we try to create an architecture or a benchmark for combining the field of deep learning with point of care lab on chip diagnostics for infectious diseases. So you essentially have a sample collected and uh, one of our chips then uh, generates current output for that sample. Uh, we convert them into individual sensor outputs feature, engineer them into spectrograms, and then feed them to an AI classifier, which gives us whether a person is healthy or infected. And so we then proposed a novel spectrogram-based approach that facilitates the application of image processing, or ML techniques, including 2D CNNs for the classification of ISFET data, ISFET chemical data. And we think that this approach can help train neural networks with a limited data set of infectious diseases for high precision and accuracy. We further went on to propose a framework towards accelerating the response for future pandemics by leveraging the combined advances in the field of spectrogram, deep learning, and electrochemical based detection to improve diagnostic accuracy, transfer learning, reduce bandwidth, reduce carbon footprint, reduce cost, and finally data privacy and security. And so for a new biomarker that is recognized for a new infectious disease, we evaluate the inference engine for this new biomarker. If the accuracy is high, we can deploy it straight away. But if it's low, then we have to collect the data again, pre-process the data, transfer learn on the pre-trained model, evaluate and optimize the model, convert the model to TF Light Micro, and then deploy it finally. And so our next steps is currently we have we have, we have sent out a chip, a winner take all architecture chip for testing is fits on 65 nanometer. And we are also going to implement this deep learning classification algorithm on a microcontroller nano 33 BLE sense. Finally, we're going to run some, some ion imaging experiments for nucleic acid amplification detection. Uh, these are the papers that you can further read if you want to 
uh, gain more insight into this topic. And thank you for listening today. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email or I would love to connect with you on LinkedIn as well. Thank you.